Ahoy there, Rum Runners, and welcome to this Pirate's Parlay. Today, we'll explore the world of cutthroat commerce with the Pirates of Penryn. But beware the Morgor. She's got quite the temper. First, let's throw down the map and get things sorted. Separate the crew cards and the whirlpool cards. Then give them a shuffle. They go in the appropriate spaces. But what about the booty? I hear there's cold hard cash to be won. The currency of the Cornish Coast setting of this game is florins, and these cards represent different denominations. Separate them by type, and once again, fill in the appropriate spaces. But face up this time. I also see a box of tokens there to populate said board with. So I figure that's the next thing. Thank you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> That's not my name. Place the following standees in this way. The Rum Runner boats go on their matching galleon spots. The Windicator is placed on the compass and starts facing southwest. Drop the Skull and Crosswinds coin nearby so all can reach. The Tide Mate goes on the starting space of the Tide Table. And finally, the Fearsome Morgor. Place her in her cave. Everyone, pick your ship colors and take the matching galleon and Rum Runner card. This is you. You stock your galleon with cards, and then your rum runner goes to town, hopefully bringing a few back. Now to fill the hold. Each galleon is dealt the following. Twelve cargo cards, one one florin card, two three florins cards, and one five florins card, and three crew cards. They go face down underneath your galleon. Now pick nine of those cards to start with on your rum runner. Take more crew if you expect to run into any trouble. Or plan to start some. And take more cargo if you feel you can safely make port. Your goal is to sell all your cargo at the various ports for maximum profits. The further away a port is, the more they'll pay for your rum. The quick start rules recommend you begin with one one florin card, one three florins card, four cargo, and three crew. Sounds reasonable to me. All that's left is to pick first player. You could flip a coin, or roll a die. Or whatever method seems fair. But the rules say that each player takes the top crew card and compares the combined total of both the charm and ferocity, then return those cards to the bottom of the deck. The ocean is a breezy place with regular changes to the depth of its waters. So to begin your turn, move the tide made one click clockwise. If she be on a light spot, it's high tide and you can sail to any space. Midshade spots are mid-tide. The light spaces are now off-limits. And a dark spot is low-tide. Only the dark spaces may be traversed, making some ports, not naming names, impassable. The shade of a space is determined by the amount of coverage. For instance, if a space be mostly dark, then it's all dark. Savvy. Now you get to flip that coin. The direction indicated is the direction to rotate the Windicator. If you sail the direction it points, you can sail faster, but you cannot sail against it. That's not how sails work. Once these things are done, your turn begins proper. The first order of business is sailing. Move all of the spaces you wish to move for this turn, because once you move on to other actions, this is where you'll stay till next time. You get to move nine spaces total. These are described as either yaws or runs. A yaw is a one move space neither with nor against the wind. And a run is a move with the wind. For this, you'll get to take two spaces as if they were one. You'll yaw more than run, but runs run faster than yaws yaw. So run your runs when you can, cause yaws just don't run in the way that a run can. Imbecile. A few things about navigating the board. If you find yourself on an unnavigatable space due to tide, you are run aground and must wait until the tide releases you on a future turn. If you sail through any part of a whirlpool, you'll take a card after your movement for each unique whirlpool you encounter. You cannot sail through the same space as other tokens. Morgor and other rum runners fill the entire spaces they occupy. You'll have to go around. And if you start your turn next to Morgor and wish to avoid her effects, you'll need to sail away immediately. Aye, let's talk about that bloody feral sea beast. Fickle more like. 
When she moves next to your rum runner, you lose one random card from your rum runner to her hoard immediately. But that makes her a great resource. And she can be bribed once per turn with cards from your rum runner. So if you like, try these out. Send a cargo card to Morgor's hoard to send her back to her cave. Once she's gotten out, naturally. Send any one crew card to the hoard to send her to an unoccupied dark space. Place her next to an opponent and say, sick em. Each adjacent rum runner now has to send one random card from their rum runner to the horde. Aye, she's a formidable weapon. You may also choose to send a Florence card to the stack once you finish moving to move that many extra spaces. I figure she gives you a little push. Once you've finished running your yaw and playing with the monster, it's time to take care of some business. And this is according to where you are and where you've been. If you went through any whirlpool spaces, take one card for each whirlpool not for each space. If it says Lucky Rascal, then that's what you are. Place the card next to your galleon until the right time. Just read it and wait. If it says Peril and Strife, well then that's less good. It'll show you what you stand to lose, as well as two ways to defeat it. If you have crew with the matching tattoo indicated, reveal it and you're done. If not, then you'll have to match or exceed the Avast requirement, which be either Charm or Ferocity. If you manage to fail the challenge, then your penalty is the loss of the stake indicated. Send it to the Horde. If you cannot pay the price, then lose a random card to the Horde, but don't reveal what it was. Then the Whirlpool card goes back to the bottom of the deck. And finally, if you drew a Morgor card, things get crazy. Move the beast to any dark, unoccupied space. This may cause some rum runners to lose cards as before, but don't reveal what they are. Now all players, or as many as it takes, may band together to reveal 17 charm to calm the beast and keep the next thing from happening. But it's up to the players. If this doesn't happen, then all ships get pushed three spaces in the indicated direction, or as far as they can go, then takes whatever consequence the new location may cause. It could push you straight into Morgor, or her cave, or whatever. Now that we're past all that awful stuff, let's say you landed on a port space. Well, most ports have a number printed next to them. That's what they'll be willing to pay you per barrel of rum. So discard any number of cargo from your rum runner and receive that much in any denomination you like. In fact, when you're in any port, you can make change as you like. Maybe you're in need of a few good mates. We're talking crew, yes? Aye, we're talking crew. And if you'd like to recruit some, just pay three florins when in a port space. You can make change if you need. Then take the top three cards of the crew deck and peruse. Add the one you want to your rum runner and send the others to the bottom of the stack. Better luck next time, mateys. Do this as many times as you want. If you're in Pon Chardon, things work a bit differently. You can move no cargo there. But once per turn and absolutely for free, you may snag the top three crew cards and press gang them onto your rum runner. <laughs> Welcome aboard, willing recruits. Now if you've pulled up next to a fellow rum runner, you may strike your colors and attack. However, you cannot attack a ship in port, at their galleon, or in Morgor's cave. And you decide which form of combat will be employed. A skirmish is a good old-fashioned battle of virtues. Throw down one or more crew from your rum runner and choose either charm or ferocity. The defender answers by revealing crew to match or beat that number. The attacker may then respond if needed, and you go back and forth until someone concedes defeat. When the battle ends, either by victory or draw, the crew are returned to their rum runners, and, in the case of a winner, they would draw two random cards from the loser's hand. By the way, that loser now cannot be the target for any other skirmishes until their next turn. I guess you can't kick them when they're down. The other option is declaring a duel. It's a more sophisticated way to deprive an honest sailor of their resources. Each player reveals a crew card at the same time, and the icons on the upper right are compared. It's rock, paper, scissors, but more piratey. Pistol beats Cutlass, Cutlass beats Parrot, and Parrot beats Pistol, for some reason. If it's a draw, the attacker may try again. Then return the crew, and the winner draws one random card from the loser, and may now gloat about their victory. <laughs> There are a few other places you may dock and reload your boat with more desirable cards. When you return to your galleon, 
Combine your Rum Runner cards with the Galleon cards, and refill your Rum Runner with nine cards. And if you be bold enough to sail into Morgor's cave, you get to go through all the cards that have been sent there and take some with you when you go. Much like trading with your Galleon, just combine the cards with the cards on your Rum Runner and take the nine you want. But hurry it up. She could be back at any moment. And if she moves into the cave while a Rum Runner is still in there, that boat is moved outside to an adjacent dark space and loses two cards to the Horde. The game continues until a player lands on their Galleon space and announces that they have no cargo cards remaining. Home and dry. This must be verified, of course, but then it's time to tally up the scores. Only cards on the Galleon or Rum Runners in their Galleon spaces are counted. You get two victory points per crew card and all Florin cards count for face value. The highest score is the winner. You'll find this game to be more enjoyable when you play with enemies. If all players just mind their own business, the game will be very uneventful. So play like a pirate. You've got to attack. You've got to set the bloody great sea beast upon your opponents. <laughs> oh, you can do your business and win the game. But unlike the AI threats and events of Merchants and Marauders, Penryn can be a very linear race to the finish unless the players agree to disagree. You can dodge every hurricane, make straight runs for the port, dump your cargo, and save your cash. The monster can stay in its cave. The swords can stay sheathed. Life can be a drag. So get mad. Yeah. Yeah. Fat head. Barnacle head. One eye. Four eyes. <clears throat> Turns often take very different amounts of time. They can be nice and short, or they can go on for a while. You could even end up having no turn at all. Let's say you've got your heart set on a port, but there's no parking left, and the rival pirates refuse to move. If they care to be annoying, they can stay there for a bit. There's no real consequence for this. Or you could get shut out of a port due to low tide, or landlocked. There are many aspects of this game that bring Dread Pirate to mind, but at the same time, it has many more features. And no dice, which will make many quite happy. Dice are evil. As far as the physical components, expect a lot of cardboard. Everything is a standee. Or a lay downy. And then there's that map. It's soft. I could use a whole blanket of this. We get it. You like it. I really like it. As far as the game goes as an experience, there are a few more rules than you'd expect from a game this simple. And it's very straightforward, but the variety of mechanisms keep it from being overly dull. The tide and wind changes keep things interesting, as does the two types of combat. And bribing the monster to bully your enemies keeps you in that piratey, take that territory. <clears throat> Overall, it's a fun addition to your pirate game collection. And it's got its own soundtrack. That's something not a lot of games can boast of. And honestly, the only reason we Americans were able to pronounce some of the names. And now it's time for us to sail on. Thanks for stopping by to check out this game with us. Make sure you're subscribed so you'll stay in the loop for future episodes. And follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where our other adventures are logged. Also, consider becoming a Pirate's Parlay patron by hitting up our Patreon. Support our efforts and we'll reward you with behind-the-scenes goodies, as well as some shiny merch. But until next time, fare thee well, well mateys! mateys. <laughs> <laughs>